Hi everyone and welcome to episode one of our design system series when we're going to look at building a design system using all the best Figma has to offer from variables to styles to just best practice. As usual you've got your Figma file in the description so you can follow along and you have a link to sign up to Figma if you've never used it before. Let's jump in. So to start off, I want us to create a palette of colors that we'll be able to use. Now we won't necessarily use all of these colors, but we'll have them kind of in our back database uh, to be used and they're all in the same sort of language together. I just want to have this red color over here and I'm going to copy the hexadecimal number and place it over here as 500. So we're basically going to create the shades for every single color from 50 to 950. You may have seen this used before. So many websites do this. There's lots of plugins that do this as well. I'll share with you the one that I like to use. So like I said, place your color from the top here as 500 because that's going to be the middle of our range. And I'll just call this red. Now I've got this hex copied. I'm going to go to the website that I prefer to use, which is this one. It's called tints.dev and it's just really simple. So I just like using this one. So paste the value into here and then it gives you that scale. So it places your color as 500 and it gives you a breakdown from 50 to 950. Two ways to copy this over into Figma. So way number one, I can split my screen and in the browser, if I scroll down, there's this kind of JSON file over here and I can just copy the hexadecimals. So if I copy the hexadecimal for 50 and then paste it into here, then I get the correct one. But the way I like to use it actually is I just take a screenshot of all of this, move it in and then I drop. So in order to screenshot on Mac, you can use command shift and four uh, and you just grab it like this and drag it into Figma. Now, once I do this, I can select my square, click on I, and then just grab this. There's a slight disadvantage to doing it this way with the color picker, because when you screenshot and move it in, it does go through a bit of changes, so it won't be the exact hexadecimal. But for me, I don't really care about it being the exact correct hexadecimal. I'm more worried about the shades looking kind of nice and cohesive, so it's not a problem for me. So I'm just gonna go on with my color picker, because it's just a bit simpler. So I'll just go ahead, click on my square, I, so once I've done that, I have this nice little color palette for all of my reds. Then I'm gonna go ahead and do that for all of my colors. So we've got all of these colors. Now I wanna move on to the gray and I wanted us to do this together because with grayscale, yeah, you could just use a normal, you know, white to black, really simple. But what I like to do is I like to throw in a bit of a tint of color in my gray. So it's not just a boring normal gray with absolutely no hue to it. It does have a bit of a hue. So if you look at my gray over here, you can see that if I go to HSB, which is hue, saturation, brightness, you can see that it does actually belong to a hue to 260. If I wasn't, I'll just duplicate this and show you. If it was just a pure gray, so if I just close this and open this again, you see that the hue would be on zero, yeah? But because I want it to resemble one of my colors and I know that purple is gonna be one of the colors that I use quite a lot, what I did is I started from this purple color over here and I just you know, lowered it down to here to a place where I can keep a bit of my saturation. If your saturation is zero, so if that middle number is zero, then when you open it again, it will revert back to zero in the hue as well. But I think I was on 260. If you even have just one in the saturation, so when I click on it, you can see that it keeps that hue, yeah? So it's just a nice little way of keeping it in the same family of the color that you'll be probably using the most. So now we have all of our colors ready to go. If you've been using my file, you will see that your squares are numbered as their shade. So each square will have, you know, this one's 600, this one's 100, etc. So what we need to do is we just need to add the name of the color before that. And if you are using your own file, I would really recommend you still follow along with this step because it will just make your life like so much easier. So I'm going to select all of my red squares and then command R which is going to open the batch renaming tool, which I love. What we're going to do is say red and then slash, and then current name. So what that does is it creates kind of a folder. So when we do create this into variables, it will know that these 950, 900, 800, etc., live within the color red. Let's keep on doing that. We'll select all of our orange ones, command R, orange slash, and then current name. Now you'll notice that in order to get current name, it's just adding a dollar sign and a ampersand. So technically I could copy this bit, so command C, rename, and then I'll just, let's say, select my yellow ones, command R, and then if I say yellow, and then I'm just pasting, so command V, 
it just pasted that and it knows that dollar sign ampersand means current name so it will do it correctly so that's kind of a trick on top of a trick for you let's keep doing that for all of our colors So now everything is named appropriately. At the time that I am filming this video, there is yet to be a plugin in Figma that can translate these colors straight into variables. Maybe when you're watching this sometime in the future, there will be one, but right now there isn't. So I have a workaround. What we're going to do is we're gonna use a plugin called Styler, which will take all of these colors and make them into styles. Then we're going to use a second plugin, which will make those styles into variables. So at the end of the day, we get variables quickly, but we have to go through two plugins to do it. Let's get started. So I will select all of my colors at once. So I'll just drag to get all my squares, hold down shift, and then just drag and drag and drag until you have all of your squares selected. I really recommend you do this in one go rather than one at a time. Once I've done that, I'll go into plugins over here between the text tool and the hand tool, and I'll look for a plugin called Styler. So it looks like this, it looks a bit like a Superman. Um, and when you click on run, you will have options to do many different things. What we want is generate styles. Once I click on that, it will think for a second, and then I'll get this little pop-up at the bottom that says it's just created 88 styles for us. How quick was that? How much time did that save? If I click on the canvas, you can see that all of these styles live here. If you do want to create these styles on your own, I do have a video that goes through how you make styles just manually and I'll link it somewhere here, but this just saves us loads of time. So now we want to translate these styles into variables. Now I had a lot of questions in the comments about what is the actual difference between styles and variables. And you'll really see that in the second half of this video where we talk about color tokens, but essentially the reason why we want to move away from styles a little bit into variables where we can is that variables can be referenced and variables create one source of truth. I can try and explain it now, but it will make more sense when we do it later. But those are the main two reasons. So now we need to transfer all of these styles into variables. So I found two plugins that do this quite well. One is styles to variables and one is styles to variable converter. Um, so if we try and use styles to variables, I'm just going to click on run and it's going to open up this thing. It's telling me all of the styles that it's detected. I want my collection to be called primitives because primitive is where we're going to have all of the colors, the numbers, all of that at their kind of lowest point at the real source of what those are. So they're not connected to anything. They're not what we use them for. It's just that, you know, that main database of everything, everything, everything. So I'll click on convert styles into variables and it says 88 color variables created. Now, moment of truth, if I click on my canvas, so I'm clicking on nothing, scroll to the top, open local variables, Look at that. So it created everything for me and even nested it nicely into those groups. Once it's done that and we know that it's fine, I can close this, click on my canvas, I'm clicking on nothing, and then just delete all of these color styles. Now my local variables are still here. I still have them, but I don't need the styles anymore. So that was our first step. We've now created 88 color variables that we can use in our designs. But right now, there's so many colors here and they don't mean anything. So the next step is going to be creating color tokens. If you look in your Figma file, you have this little frame here that is just basic color tokens. And what do we mean by that? These are the basics of what we need because we're going to reuse this a lot in our designs. So the main one is going to be the grayscale one. And we're going to have three kinds of surfaces. We're going to have the default one, then a subtle version and a disabled version. We're going to have three versions of the border. One's a bit darker, one's disabled and one's default. And then for the texts and icons and labels, we're going to have a color for title, body, subtitle, caption, negative. So one that's on dark essentially and a disabled. And that's going to be what we're going to be using later on in our design. If I have a title somewhere in my design, I just search for the variable title and I know that it's that one. And then we're going to look at more semantic -y colors. So we're going to have primary surfaces, primary borders and primary labels. We're also going to do the same box for error states, warning states and success states. So let's start with just our normal grayscale. So if we go into our local variables right now, I've got this primitive collection and I wanna create a new collection. So I'll create a new one and I'll call it style tokens. So we're gonna create our first variable in here. It's gonna be a color variable and I'm going to call it grayscale slash surface slash default. 
and that's gonna put it in basically two groupings. So grayscale is gonna be the first group, and then inside of that, it's gonna be a group called surface, and that's because of the slash. So our first one is this default one. Now, for the default surface, let's choose which variable we're going to reference. So we're gonna use an alias. If I go into here and into libraries, I can see all of my primitive colors from before. So I'm gonna to wanna to select one of the grayscale colors for this because we're just using grayscale. And I think grayscale 100 probably is going to be my default kind of surface color. And then I need to create another one called subtle. So if I just create it inside of here, it's going to already group it inside of subtle and grayscale. I think my subtle one would probably be grayscale 50 because it needs to be lower. Then let's have a look. I need a disabled one. So for disabled, I probably want to go a bit darker. So maybe 200. Yeah, great. So those are the first three. We'll go ahead and assign those in a second. Let's have a look at border. So I'll go inside of grayscale and just create a new variable in here and I'll call it border slash default. So now you see it's created that second group. And don't worry if something isn't sitting in the correct group, you can just drag it out and move it in between. Now the last one I need to do is all of my labels. So I'll go into grayscale again, just so I'm one level up in the grouping, add a new color variable and call it text slash title. So for my titles, I probably wanted them to be as dark as I can. So I'll use 900 or 950, yeah, 900. Then the next one is going to be body. For body, I want it to be a bit lighter, but still pretty dark. So 800, and you see it's not a huge difference, but it will give me that small bit of differentiation again when I actually use it. Um, next is subtitle. And I think for these, I'm just gonna kind of go down the scale, uh, but make sure that you're not going into too, too light of a color because then you won't really be able to see it and it won't pass with accessibility. Caption, probably 500. And then negative, remember negative is our kind of on dark. So it's if the text is on a dark background. So for this, I do wanna use a lighter color. So I might use 50 actually. Um, and then our last one is disabled. And I wanna use mm, mm, probably like 500. Yeah, it's the same as caption though. Let's try 400, it might be too light later on if we actually use it on the 200 disabled background, but we can change it later on. That's the beauty of using variables. So we've now got our first style tokens. Let's assign those quickly. So I'll select my subtle square, go into style button over here and just write subtle. I have that ready to go. Do the same here. So it's surface default. So I've assigned all of those. Now let's move on to this one. So with the other kind of semantic colors, I do wanna create a new collection for those and you'll see why. So I'll go into my collections and I'll create a new collection and I'll call it semantic colors. So what we're gonna do for this one is we're going to create the primary one. Then we're gonna create three more modes for success, error, and warning. Now. Modes are only available on the Figma professional plan. You have a link to sign up to that in my description if you want one. If you are on a free account and you're not using modes, that's absolutely fine. Just use groupings instead of modes. So create a group for primary, a group for warning, a group for error, and a group for success. Don't use different collections, just different groups. So inside of semantic colors, let's do our first one. So we're going to call it surface default. And then, like I said, we'll create those modes. So one mode will be primary, error, warning, and success. So for my primaries, I'm probably gonna use my 500. And this is what makes the aliases just so easy to use because for primary, I know my primary is gonna be purple. So I'll go into libraries and just say purple 500, boom. Now error is gonna be red. So I'll write red 500. Warning, I want it to be orange. So orange 500. And success is gonna be green. I can also just write 500 and then just find the green one. I'm gonna go ahead and do the same for all of the surfaces, all of the borders and all of the labels. I'll do that now. Great, so now we've created all of those semantic colors. We've got our surface, border and text. We've got the mode primary, error, warning and success. Now let's assign these so we can just do that really quickly over here. I'm gonna search for surface and then we know it's inside of semantic colors not inside of grayscale so subtle lighter 
default, darker. So now that that's all connected, so they're each connected to the correct color, because we use modes, if I just make this a bit bigger, I can take my primary, copy it over here. So I'm just holding down option to copy it. Then next to the layer section of the design panel, I can change the variable mode. So instead of primary, I'm just gonna change it to error. And you can see how everything just changed automatically. So we've just got that lovely little documentation here. I'll just make that a bit bigger and have space for my warning and my success as well. So I'll change this one to warning and this one to success. Amazing. So now with my design tokens, I've basically created this whole design system that allows me to use these colors anywhere I need in my design. So if I'm creating a button, I know to use the default surface on top of it, I will use the text label or I use a negative text or anything like that. And I know that I have these colors ready to go for when we build our components later on. So that's episode one of our design system series. We are going to create a typography system in our next episodes. So make sure to look out for that. Leave a comment below. Let me know how you're getting on. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you at the next one.